I'm always at a constant fear of failure, but I like that, it makes me high. That thing of like hating something is a process you go through in making it. But you have to get that emotions out of you as well, you know? Because in a way, the more you hate it, the more you're gonna love it. Nicholas Winding Refn is the self-proclaimed pornographer of cinema. His movies are characterized by his hyper depictions of sex, violence, and crime. We're here in Copenhagen to talk to him about his new film, The Neon Demon. I see 20 or 30 girls come in here every day, mostly from small towns with big dreams. And they're all good. You, you're going to be great. Winding Refn is best known for his neo-noir thrillers Drive and Only God Forgives with Ryan Gosling. But these are a far cry from the films which put him on the map in his native Denmark. He shot his first films, the Pusher Trilogy and Bleeder, in the meatpacking district in Copenhagen, where we came to meet him. Thank you for having us here in Copenhagen. These were the streets where you filmed Pusher. What was it that motivated you to kind of tell that Danish story? Uh, well, I was young, uh, I was 24, and I kind of like knew that genre movies were, you know, good business. Also financially, it was very inexpensive because I wanted to make it, quote unquote, like a documentary. And that's how it all began. I wrote the script with the arrogance of not knowing how to write a script, and I directed it with the arrogance of not knowing how to direct. And I was just extremely lucky. Pusha 2 was something that you made because you were in kind of a financial hole. And so you were forced to go back and make a sequel for your debut. Did you feel compromised during that period? Um, well, I owed my bank a million dollars. And when you owe your bank a million dollars, you have to do something very, very specific, which is to pay off your debt. But many things had accumulated. I'd gone bankrupt. I'd made a film which didn't turn out very good, rather creatively or financially. It was actually a complete disaster. My career was like over. I was a has-been and I'd just turned 30. The only way to pay off my debt was to make Pusher 2 and 3. And I hated making it in the beginning because I felt like well, I was, I was born for greatness, and here I am repeating myself. But having gone past that, I really quickly realized that these are better films. Push Two and Three are much better films than the first one. So in a way, it was like God gave me a chance to start over again with all the knowledge that I had obtained making my first three films. And I'm gonna tell you something, money is a very good reason for work because fear of not being able to eat or pay your rent is a great way to be very creative very quickly, you know? So I guess I was more creative than ever really for the first time with Pusher 2 and 3 because I just had to make things work. The Pusher films follow various down-and-out gangsters, murderers and drug lords through the Danish underworld. Despite Winding Refn's concerns, the second and third movies ended up being not only great films, but critical and financial successes, which propelled him closer to a Hollywood career. After Pusher 2 and 3, it was like year zero in a way. And that's when I started making films purely based on what I would like to see and not about how I thought I would be perceived. And that needed to be a very autobiographical film, and that was Bronson. Bronson, which is massive in England, obviously, it's a film about probably Britain's most notorious criminal. I mean, I don't think his story was worth a movie, but I love the idea of a human being basically giving themselves into their alter ego which is essentially what Bronson did. You know, going from Michael Peterson to Charlie Bronson. My name's Charles Bronson. 
There's nothing wonky about my upbringing. Like most kids, I got into trouble. But it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad, bad. And all my life, I've wanted to be famous. The movie starts with Charlie Bronson saying, all my life, I wanted to be famous. I've said that line a billion times. And so that became a film about Nick Reffin using Charlie Bronson's storyline. With Neon Demon, the film's set in LA, and you've said many times that you love LA. But this is a film that kind of demonizes industries that are very dominant. Was it being involved with Hollywood more that showed you that kind of world? No, it was more that I began to see, you know, my eldest is, girl is 12, and I can see how the digital revolution is opening a whole new world to her that I didn't have when I was young. But also it's like narcissists looking into a mirror that's unattainable. You know, it's an artificial world. And everyone in that world is a heightened reality. Any runway experience? Not really. Okay, let's see the walk, dear. It's a film kind of showing the dangers of a young woman coming into this industry. And at the same time, you're making a film about Elle Fanning, who is this budding new star, and that's probably going to propel her further into the starlight. Was that something that you were thinking no, about? it wasn't so much I was thinking about it, but what was great was that everything just felt so right. I mean, in terms of casting, I felt I could either cast an unknown or it was going to be Elle Fanning. Elle was literally 16 when we started the film, you know, walks into this world of opportunities, world of illusions. My wife had seen uh, one of her latest films and, you know, said she was just so amazing. So we met at my house and after 20 minutes, I was more like, you're born to play this part, do you want to do it? And she was like, sure. And I said, great, we start in eight weeks. You have always kind of had these well, you've called them kind of homoerotic relationships with specific male actors, like you had Mads Mikkelsen, you had Tom Hardy, and obviously everyone knows Ryan Gosling. This is the first film where you've had an all-female cast where you've kind of moved away from that. What kind of replaced that relationship for you? For making The Neon Demon, it all kind of came down to that I had all these ideas, but I didn't know quite to click it or what the subject was really going to be. Until one day I realized, well, I have an extremely beautiful wife. I wonder what it's like being beautiful. And the idea that beauty as a currency has continued to rise ever since, I guess, man began. And especially with the digital revolution, it has exploded. The obsession, the necessity, the, the power of it. And so I said, I want to make a movie about the insanity of beauty. And then all these ideas I had fell into place. Winding Reffin's life beyond his films isn't a mystery. In Gambler and My Life, directed by, we see Nicholas Winding Reffin behind the camera as he struggles fulfilling various commitments. Feels like Nicholas Winding Reffin, a producer, Henrik Bernstrup, saw to pay him and get in million class after their film to escape and double back go concurs. Det er jo fem og halv million, vi personligt hænger på. You have these two amazing documentaries about you. What were the motivations for kind of allowing those to go out? Was it that you wanted to kind of build that cult of celebrity? Or was it that you want people to be able to see the personal side of you? I mean, the first one, Gambler, came at a time when 
I didn't really know what was going to happen in my life. And a very good documentary filmmaker who was friends with my wife was like, I want to document you making these two films, getting out of all the money you own, and and also just the that kind of insanity that everything was in at the moment. So I was like, yeah, sure, you know, why not? You know, there is something therapeutic in being exhibitionistic about your problems. It's a way to release, you know, it's like if everyone knows it, it's almost like, well, then we can all just relax and move on. The second feature talk, which is very different in a way, because it's really not about me. It's when we were in Bangkok and Liv, my wife, was like, what, what am I going to do in Bangkok? And she just one day said, I'm, I want to document our life. It was very therapeutic because, you know, I got to say things to her that I couldn't say to anyone else because you could never show weakness as a director, because you have to make sure everyone believes in what you're doing. But I think that film really more became essentially also about her having to accept the kind of life that we live and what it's like being the woman in these kind of situations, which is extremely difficult, you know, both for what she wants to do with her life, which is maybe not as clear as it is for me, but also what she has to give up. And I think it was very therapeutic for us, for her to make that. So I don't like watching them afterwards. You know, it's like, I feel I'm taking my clothes off in public, which is, you know, frightening. But I like the concept of them. I like that I have gone through it. Yes, it's done. Yes, it's done. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Forstår du med, at jeg siger, at det er ligesom klikket? Der slipper lige seks måneder af vores liv. This is an extraordinary bit, where you're just kind of hitting yourself on the head, saying, I'm basically saying that you're not sure whether Only God Forgives was a good film. Would you ever regret saying that? No, because you say that in every movie. And there hasn't been one movie where I thought it was going to be great and turned out disastrous. I'm always at a constant fear of failure, but I like that. It makes me high. It excites me. It arouses me. And I think that that thing of like hating something is a process you go through in making it. Like you really hate it and you wish you never made it because it's going to fail miserably. But you have to get that emotions out of you as well, you know? Because in a way, the more you hate it, the more you're going to love it. I heard that you really like hands and that you used to moisturize your hands when you were younger. No, I used to have my mother f uh, uh, moisturize my hands with Vaseline and put gloves on them when I was sleeping. <laughs> Do you have soft hands today? I have the softest hands you will ever meet on any man. Do you mind if we shake hands? Absolutely. Oh my God, they're really soft. <laughs> thank you for being here today and thank you so much for our interview. Cool. They're really soft, really guys. Soft. <laughs> God damn, they're soft. <laughs>